and welcome to the European Resilience Initiative Center video podcast. Today, our guest is Pekka Kalionini. He is a postdoc research fellow at the Tampere University, and he focuses on studying how social media spread information and most important disinformation, and how does Russian disinformation being spread through our informational space. He is also a founder of Vatnik Soup Project, which researches how exactly the Western opinion leaders willingly or unwillingly spread this Russian disinformation. Thank you for having found your time and welcome, Pekka. Yeah, great to be here. My first question is, like recently you have posted a long thread on alleged connections of uh, Elon Musk um, with the Russian disinformation and how he could willingly or unwillingly uh, helped um, the Russians to spread some of their ideas. And many people uh, believe that likes under your uh, popular threat have uh, mysteriously disappeared or been like reduced or something like that. Uh, can you elaborate more about it? So yeah, the, the story starts uh, started about a week ago uh, when uh, Elon Musk published a post or tweet uh, that criticized uh, President Zelensky. And uh, I, I will reply to that. And then I shared an old uh, Twitter thread I wrote uh, back in June about Elon Musk, about how, how in my view, he's uh, promoting uh, Russian propaganda and disinformation. And uh, then people started sending me these messages that they they've read the uh, the thread before they've read the posts before but their likes aren't showing anymore and they remember liking the uh, the posts so uh, it 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 was a little bit confusing and then it kind of uh, people uh, it, it it became this big group of people who actually claimed that their like had disappeared I think I think you were one of them also so it was strange because uh, this kind of thing didn't really hadn't happened before. So uh, uh, a lot of people started investigating and they realized that it could take like five seconds to maybe two days or even three, four days before their like disappears again. And uh, uh, it's weird because it's, it's a post that criticizes the owner of the platform and uh, these likes are not showing. Uh, and I've asked uh, the ex uh slash twitter support uh if, if if it's a bug if it's a like a glitch in the system but i haven't had any any response from them and uh, it's still ongoing and uh this also led to a kind of a strike and effect as as the 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 threat about elon musk now has i think it has maybe 32 million views so it kind of went viral at the same time wow that is amazing. Once again, like we don't know, like if uh, there was like some software issue or um, like it was uh, removed deliberately. I personally seen, I have personally seen my likes being like removed or disappeared. Some people told me it was like a technical issue that the uh, the software was overloaded. We don't know it, but what we know for sure is that the X uh, social media, like the the former Twitter is a place where the Russians love to spread their disinformation and they love to use this platform and post their uh, opinions or thoughts or their campaigns. What are your observations? How are social media being used by the Russians to spread their campaigns? And what is a normal strategy of these campaigns? What it's all about? So uh, the basic strategy is called Firehose of Falsehood, which basically focuses on spreading high volume uh, information on high volume and multi-channel approach. So uh, most of the social media platforms are used. Uh, they use Instagram, they use Facebook, they use Twitter, especially Twitter now uh, after uh, Elon took over. Uh, so, but they also kind of promote these super so-called super spreaders of disinformation. So, for example, uh, Donald Trump supporters they tend to spread quite a bit of of pro pro Kremlin propaganda. So they um, uh, they amass a lot of following to these accounts, 
and then they kind of uh, spread their message and make them seem these accounts make make these accounts seem bigger than they actually are. And uh, in the last few months, we've seen this uh, on very uh, on, on on many prominent uh, programming accounts like uh, Jackson Hinkle, uh, DD Geopolitics, these very big uh, channels or individuals who promote Kremlin propaganda. They've grown immensely. And uh, this could be due to troll farms and bot farms uh, being activated again, because uh, what Elon Musk did before previously, he fired everybody from the safety, Twitter safety uh, group. Uh, and basically, there's no humans working there anymore. It's probably most like most of it works automatically. And... Uh, it's based on volume, so if a if, uh, post, for example, gets a lot of reports, it may be removed, uh, the user may be suspended, but there's no human factor included. So uh, it's completely automated. Uh, so these troll farms, they can kind of activate again because there is no control over them anymore. Wow. Uh, it is, uh, I repeat once again, Tekla Kaleonomi. He is a postdoc research fellow at the Tampere University and a specialist in disinformation uh, campaigns and how social media can be involved in, dis in spreading of disinformation. Don't forget to like, to subscribe, to share this video podcast and write your comments uh, under this under this video. But uh, Pekka, could you explain uh, this all propaganda campaigns? We know that they have not started uh, recently. They started years ago when uh, the Russians first founded their troll farms in Petersburg, maybe later in different, in, in other cities. Uh, but up today, we in the West should have learned how to deal with that because it's not a new phenomenon, but it looks like we still as unprepared as we used to be and the, the Russians continue to spread their, their ideas uh, without any problem. What is, uh, what is wrong here with our, with our immunity? So yeah, I mean, I've I've called it uh, an asymmetrical information war. So basically, uh, Western media, Western journalists uh, tend to care about the truth. It's uh, it's it's what we 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 always try to go for the truth. Of course, we can never achieve the like we don't know what what is the real truth, but we 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 investigate. We try to figure out what's actually going on. Whereas in Russia. Or in Kremlin, it's more about uh, so-called tactical truth. So whatever fits the narrative, or whatever makes uh, kind of uh, kind of helps with your agenda, that is the truth. And uh, they can they have no problem in lying, even when they know that they are lying. So uh, that's that's the problem. So uh, Russia has no. Uh, trouble spreading lies if it helps them and then uh they know that in in the west we kind of have to try to find the truth uh so basically they always expect us to debunk their lies and it's it's this constant flow of lies and it's just the high volume it's impossible to do for example fact checking on all these uh, topics what they're doing and uh, once the fact checking has been done, it's already too late because it, the new narrative was already in in many people's minds. So this is a big problem. Uh, I'm not saying that we should start lying to the West too, but uh, I think there needs to be good counter for this kind of strategy where uh, the truth does not even matter. Uh, and uh, maybe sorry if I can still uh, say briefly that. Uh, the social media movement NAFO has been very effective in countering this Russian uh, machinery because it also focuses on volume, but it also focuses on ridiculing uh, the disinformation and the lies that they spread. Yeah, that is uh, uh, very important. I think what you what you have mentioned currently. I, I've talked like to several people who said that uh, the Russians they don't care exactly what you say. They don't care about uh, persuading us that something what they talk what they say is right. They want us to stop believing that something we know is true. They want like to organize some sort of DDoS attack 
on informational level overwhelming us with uh, with the amount of information disinformation. So we uh, spend all our time in trying to debunk their lies, while it's impossible to debunk like thousands or ten thousands of lies a day. So we just like we cannot do anything practically. We just are in constant defense. But uh, coming back to your to your project, Vatnik Soup. Uh, what was the idea behind it? Why what Nick Soup? What it's all about? Um, so another quite long story. Uh, a long time ago, I left social media for mainly for these reasons. Uh, it polarizes people. It kind of removes the human factor, and also there's a lot of disinformation. So I left all all social media. But after uh, Russia launched their full-scale invasion in, in Ukraine, I decided, okay, maybe social media is, because I know I've researched it, maybe it's the platform where I can make a difference. So, um, but very quickly I noticed that the fire hose of falsehood system was very much in place. So I, I was kind of overwhelmed with the Russian propaganda. And uh, it's always the same people and it's always the same stories. So I, I figured I could maybe uh write about these actors who they are why do they why they do what they do what motivates them and also what are the narratives that they spread so i don't have to have these conversations again and again and again because i it's just an endless kind of uh argumentation like uh, it was like it felt like a groundhog day where i was having these conversations all over again uh so that's that's basically why i started doing what mix soup but it's I never intended to make it as big as it is today. And you like uh, you have chosen the name because Vatnik, uh, for those like who listen to us, uh, is uh, like some sort of a negative description of a person who blindly believes in Russian propaganda and leaves the Russian propaganda. Uh, but who are these people? Like you debunk a lot of uh, people who willingly or unwillingly serve as uh, super spreaders, you call them. Uh, but what are motives uh, behind uh, their actions? Why do they do this? It's not all about money. Uh, I cannot believe it's all about money. Um, so yeah, I, I commonly use an acronym called MICE. Uh, so money, uh, ideology, uh, compromise, or compromise, and ego. Uh, we can we can usually put people under these uh have some one of these or mo- many of these categories so of course some are motivated by money many journalists so-called journalists are are motivated by money but there are for example uh people who kind of long for the old soviet times or communism this kind of stuff also people who may be blackmailed because they have done something uh and there is like proof of that so uh Putin used this quite a bit uh, in, in when, when he was kind of still working for the FSB. So he used a lot of videotapes and this kind of recordings as a compromise. Uh, and then, of course, ego. Some people just want to be adored. Uh, they want to be noticed. Uh, I often talk about uh, Douglas McGregor, for example, who used to work for the U.S. Army. But his career kind of stalled, so he, he couldn't uh, progress anymore career-wise. So he may have, and uh, may, he possibly became this bitter person towards uh, the U.S. Army, towards the United States, and now he's providing a anal- very pro Kremlin analysis on the, on the Russia-Ukrainian war. And another example is uh, former weapons inspector uh, Scott Reader, who was also. Uh, kind of his career stall was stalled and uh yeah he's doing the same uh, same as McGregor does when you uh, address uh the actions of these people uh it came like like it is one one uh story when you like uh work on certain narrative and you debunk the narrative and another story when you address certain people you came like create a lot of negative uh, reaction on that. You can be attacked. Uh, do you face like some uh, sort of attempts like to silence you or to 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 counter your actions on social media? 
Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I get a lot of threats of violence. Uh, that's, uh, I think that's just how it is. If you start doing this kind of work, uh, you just have to kind of uh, deal with it. Uh, but also uh, people threaten with lawsuits. Uh, so the first threat game came from uh, Kim.com, who, who currently lives in New Zealand. Uh, and I, I wrote, I published a Wapnik soup on him. And he said that he sued me and he was looking for a lawyer or solicitor in Finland. But of course, he never was. It was all, all just bullshit, basically. Uh, but yeah, more recently, uh, I've been threatened to sue uh, by an uh, Austrian journalist uh, called Christian Verschus. Uh, who uses uh, well he he I, I published a Vatnik soup on him which basically just I just referred to something that he had seen, said in 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 the past and uh, they, they they sent his lawyer sent me an email that I should remove this part this part and uh, yeah I told them I, I won't be removing any parts and uh, if they if they want to uh, file a lawsuit then go ahead Wow, that is amazing! Like being being a person receiving like legal legal or legal suits or threats from from Austria. Uh, but uh, when you uh, look at the narratives uh, that these people spread in different countries, can you uh, can you say that uh, it differs the Russian narratives which are being spread in the US differs from those in Germany or in Austria or in Central European countries? Uh, so do you mean the the Russian propaganda is it is it different in different areas yes. or yes so yeah sure uh, definitely I mean they they try to find their target groups and then they go with the narratives that fit that target group so uh, for example in the United States it's more it's a, they they talk a lot about the so called corruption uh, in Ukraine that the money and the weapons are not going to uh, Ukraine, but they are they go to mafia or whatever like organized crime, and uh, the money is just being laundered by the rich people and global elites. Um, pretty much the same is uh, used in 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 Europe, but also there's a lot more talk about inflation, how everything is getting more expensive. Of course, the energy issue is is a big topic. Like uh, you will freeze in the winter, and nobody will have money to buy anything. This kind of stuff. Uh, but yeah, it's. Uh, I think there are main themes that are used everywhere, but then they are kind of they make slight adjustments so that they uh, kind of work in a in a local context. Do you Western media help spreading this uh, propaganda? Uh, in Germany, we have a pretty intense discussion uh, among expert circles how German media try to provide a uh, pseudo uh, neutrality or pseudo balance by repeatedly inviting to talk shows or as uh, interview partners, people who are famous, who are notorious for being very close to Kremlin. Uh, is there like some sort of shared responsibility between social media and uh, standard media when standard media say, okay, like we need to, to counter some like Russian critics by inviting a person who uh, like doesn't work maybe for Russia today, but is uh, known for for being friend of Putin. Uh, I mean, I feel I feel like it's okay to have all kinds of perspectives on the war, but uh, you always have to realize that it's this the, these perspectives will be used as a propaganda weapon too. So they are part of the hybrid warfare. There's just one aspect of the hybrid warfare and they will be used probably against, for example, if Germany does this, it, they will be used against Germany at some point and uh, uh, they, they will be used to attack the democratic system in, 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 these, in many Western countries and they will be used to kind of defame uh, these countries. So you just kind of always have to realize what what can the consequences of doing this be. But I, I'm all for uh, kind of free media where, uh, I mean, it's up to the producers and who do, who do these shows. They can, of course, decide who they invite, but you always have to always keep in mind the consequences of this too. 
Um, and I, I will I, I will also say about Finnish broadcasting system, uh, uh, Finnish broadcasting company that it's it's they've also brought out a different perspective on the war. So the, they've interviewed people in the Donbas, in Luhansk, uh, Donetsk area, uh, kind of bring out the perspective. And uh, I, I feel like it's still important to do this kind of balanced uh, reporting too, but you always have to realize that, that uh, there is kind of a limit to that. Uh, and uh, in many ways, it can help uh, the Kremlin also. Uh, can we uh, today, with all these information wars and uh, propaganda attacks, can we uh, just, as like people who work with information, can we just provide some pure information, or do we need always to provide context? Uh, I can imagine like how some media like quote Lavrov or Putin because it is of course um something which you should you should uh, mention in use when Lavrov or Putin says something but uh, is providing their statements without bringing them into context isn't not also helping them to spread their narratives yes definitely i mean if if you just let them speak and that's the news i don't think that's you're just kind of promoting uh, their agenda their propaganda so unless you kind of uh, also bring out the context it's it's basically just uh, spreading kremlin propaganda at that point uh, for sure but that uh, makes but doesn't it make like all the all the uh, process much complicated uh, because when we need every time to to provide context and explain it makes media to explainers and uh, which makes many people unhappy with what media do. And they say, okay, we don't need uh, something, some explanation from media, just give us information. We will find out by ourselves what is going on in the world. Like, is it not a paradox when trying to, to bring things into context, uh, media can alienate their audiences? Uh, I mean, neutral media, I, I, I find it in, in many ways a myth these days uh, i would say that most media companies have some kind of agenda or some kind of idea uh, that they have behind their uh, activity um uh, and also people don't people find uh, just informing it, it's boring if uh, so if you have this uh, basically every news uh, article has some kind of context so we can just kind of expand on that but uh i mean context in terms of news i think it's crucial because otherwise it's just informing or um uh, it's just putting out uh, i don't know the english word but just stating what has happened uh in a way but most if you look at most news they have some kind of context and that's what makes them interesting uh speaking about the context and information campaign and disinformation campaign uh this this current fight on social media is not the new one we have already had a lot of disinformation campaigns during the covid pandemic and earlier before do you see like how uh, how certain patterns of spreading information or disinformation how they uh repeated from one campaign to another uh, yeah, definitely. They try always try to kind of connect these disinformation campaigns and especially conspiracy theories. So once you can combine different themes, uh, it becomes this. It becomes more effective. So if I if I if I tell you an example, so a lot of the COVID nineteen conspiracy theorists became pro Kremlin uh, uh, propagandists uh, right after. The, the war in Ukraine started, uh, or the full-scale war. And uh, in many ways, this, this was also prepared uh, in, 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 with this message that you cannot trust uh, the authorities, you cannot trust the government, you cannot trust mainstream media journalists, you cannot trust anybody else but yourself, basically. And then they are offered these alternative versions of, of uh, what is COVID-19, what are the vaccines, and so on. And uh, then basically when this trust has, has already crumbled towards the authorities, you can say uh, that 
you cannot trust your government with war either. So it's always this kind of connecting things that makes it more effective. Uh, of course, it works in, in different things like NATO, COVID-19, uh, war in Ukraine, probably will have a lot of uh, disinformation related to the situation, conflict in Israel. So yeah, they always try to make this uh, kind of an umbrella conspiracy theory that you can put everything under it and it becomes this uh, like master conspiracy theory. So it is all about trust, uh, distrust, and trying to question uh, question the the current uh, the current informational uh, picture of the world. Yes, and uh, as I mentioned before, it's an asymmetrical information warfare because they can lie and they don't have they don't have any responsibility for the truth uh, to tell the truth. But uh, in, in in the Western democratic system, journalism usually works in a way that we we thrive and we try to find the truth. Uh, is there any uh, any ways to stop this by legal means? Uh, of course, there are projects like yours or by other experts and even volunteers who try to debunk the propaganda narratives and uh, networks of, uh, of bots and trolls and disinformation spreaders. But is there any chance to cut it by legal means by, by in the EU or at the level of national states? Is it, after all, a security uh, issue? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, there's uh, just this year, uh, this Digital Services Act uh, uh, was adopted by the EU states, uh, which uh, forbids uh, the spread of disinformation, uh, for example, related to uh, the, the Russia-Ukrainian war or COVID-19 vaccines and so on. And uh, we can already see that this, for example, on, on Twitter, uh, where you can report uh, in the EU region, you can report uh, material that's uh, kind of against this Digital Services Act. I think the the problem there is that it's still so vague. So, what is this information? What is what what is forbidden? What is allowed? Where where do they draw the line? It's uh, it needs to be more clear. But it's a good start, in my view. But uh, once again, like coming to the uh, to the legal definitions, you have already mentioned it is hard to say what is disinformation when some people say uh, their opinion as. It can be even like even a fair opinion when they believe it that uh, Russia has certain rights to do something. And they don't like say openly we celebrate like killing of civilians. They say, yeah, we do not know who have who have attacked the civilians, or maybe there was uh, just like an attempt to strike military facility. Maybe there were like some uh, uh, neo Nazis, so people say, etc. So it's always very hard to to define. Where is this information and how can you prove the the wish of the person, the concrete person to lie to you? A person can always say, I absolutely believe what, what, what I was writing. I just quoted serious media like uh, Russian state agencies or something. Yeah, it is. It is a big challenge. And that's that's uh, why there needs to be a group effort to kind of fight it. Uh, and uh, I, I still feel like people should be entitled to their opinion, but uh, we also have to kind of focus on exposing organized systems that spread these narratives. Uh, so when it when it becomes kind of organized activity and there's, for example, money involved or, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, compromised uh, ideology involved, then it needs to be, when it when it's like... It's on an organizational level, uh, then it becomes a problem in my view. Uh, individuals, uh, I mean, anybody can. That's that's the that's also uh, kind of the the democracies democracies democratic countries should allow people to state their views and state their opinions on things. That's that's perfectly fine. But again, we see this asymmetry. Can you do it in Russia? Can you say? Uh, can you can you kind of condemn the war and uh, nothing happens in Russia? No, cannot. But in in that sense, I feel like the Western democracies are like uh, we have to protect this uh, 
right for free speech as long as it doesn't hurt anybody and as long as it doesn't work on this like a big organizational level. Uh, regarding this organizational level, uh, can it work uh, when we somehow limit or even uh, forbid uh, these campaigns being funded from the rock states? Uh, like to introduce for social uh, media something like FARA in the US, uh, this uh, lobby, lobbyists limiting approach, uh, limiting the, uh, the presence of Russian propaganda channels, Russian media, etc. Some of them, Russia today, are already formally banned uh, in the EU, but we may also spread it to, uh, to like Russia controlled uh, social media, social media uh, groups or Russia controlled uh, media channels. Um... So yeah, first of all, I don't think uh, banning our RT in, in Europe made any any difference. Uh, I don't think that's even necessary. I think we kind of have to have access. For example, researchers, uh, journalists should have access to these channels. I just don't see the point in that because we still have uh, many other networks. Like you can you can go to TAS website, you can go to uh, some Sputnik websites, you can go to Rukli. Roughly, which is basically the uh, kind of just a uh, uh, entertaining version of artsy. Uh, so I don't think it's it was more like a uh, uh, well, how would I call it? It was kind of this cheap tactic to, to so that they can say that they are doing something. Uh, but I don't really see the point in in kind of banning RT in EU. EU, but. Uh, yeah, I think we just need counter uh, arguments. I think we need informing. We need better system. It is, for example, education system needs to take these things into account so that we can we can kind of uh, tell the difference between uh, disinformation and information, for example, and uh, like media literacy, this kind of stuff. So we need to educate people more and center less. That's that's my view. That is a very interesting point on educating and providing support, not by banning uh, some disinformation, by but but by increasing our capacities to filter it. It's Pekka Kalionimi, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the Tampere University and expert in social networks, spreading of information, and um, and so the, the networks of uh, super spreader, as he says, of uh, misinformation. Uh, you have already mentioned that the new conflicts and new wars bring more and more disinformation into game. The last case is uh, the situation around the Gaza Strip uh, in Israel. And we will clearly see uh, other such campaigns like around Taiwan or in other regions in the world. Uh, but what kind of new tactics can we expect? Are new technological uh, means like... Uh, artificial intelligence produced photographs or videos, deep fakes, uh, do you think they will play a significant role in the future? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's just something that they'll put uh, on top of the old tactics. Um, what uh, is happening right now is people are, there's so much uh, information coming, uh, coming from Israel that a lot of it is actually just blatant disinformation or sometimes misinformation. So sometimes people spread information that is uh, kind of fake news, but without them knowing that. So that can even have, that can also happen. So, uh, but for example, I'll, I've seen a lot of videos coming from Syria from, I don't know, three years back or video game material even. So video games are becoming uh, so realistic that you can even, even fool some people with this type of uh, footage but as as ai progresses as we have more as we get more convincing uh, deep fake videos and ai generated images it's going to be very difficult to tell uh what's real and what's not so that's that's the biggest problem i would say in, in the coming one to three years so it's uh we've already seen so much progress in these technologies the development of, the, of these de uh, technologies that uh, people cannot really keep up at this point anymore. And we've already seen some convincing AI-generated images that kind of became news uh, uh, because, yeah, they looked so convincing.
what will it mean for our society when uh, you can like register an account uh, of like president of the United States or Russian president or German federal chancellor with a similar uh, name? And we have already seen uh, the cases like, for example, a fake account of German uh, foreign minister Annalena Baerbock which was uh, extremely like your account and they even posted some statements allegedly made by Annalena Baerbock it was presented as a satire as a, like uh, as joke but it had consequences when people believed that Annalena Baerbock really said something when the next step would be producing a deep fake video of Annalena Baerbock saying something on the foreign politics of Germany uh, it can have very real consequences up to attacks on embassies or uh, some some actions of of states. Uh, how can we protect us from this wave? Can we protect us? Um, that's a good question. I think we can, but we just have to figure out to develop technologies that kind of counter these. So when 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 we think about ai there's always uh, an algorithm or group of algorithms that generate the image so we have to uh, generate algorithms that detect uh, the elements that make make it like what are the what are the uh, what clues in the, in the in this material that can tell us that it's not definitely fake we already have these tools that can tell you okay it's it's 90% there's 90 percent chance that this video is fake so they already there are these detections to tools but they need to be we need to make them better because we, we always need to counter these uh deep fake videos and ai generated images and uh, so we it's just a matter of, of of research and development in my view well that is a, a very uh scary perspective of our future maybe social networks would be legally obliged to say it with the digital markets act uh, legally obliged to install some filters which post you uh, like which warn you automatically when they um have when they they, they see signs of uh, the video or photo has been generated with uh, the algorithm you have mentioned then you will see the posting but there will be a warning that there is a chance that uh, this picture has been uh, artificially intelligence uh, created. We don't know. But anyway, it was an amazing, an amazing talk. Thank you so much for your insights, for having um, having shows us these murky waters and dangerous deeps of uh, the misinformation, disinformation, and how it affects uh, social media and our activities. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, don't forget to subscribe, to like, to share this content. Thank you for having been with us today. Thank you very much.